Hello, everyone. My name is Gitika Gorthy, and today I am very, very excited and honored to be interviewing a very special space champion and my personal role model, Dr. Swati Mohan. Dr. Mohan is currently at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory as the chief engineer for the Mars Launch System, the first rocket that will launch off the surface of another planet, carrying samples from Mars. She was recently guidance, navigation, and controls lead and a chief engineer in mission control for the Psych mission, where she helped triage of anomalies during operations. Furthermore, she was also the GNC operations and systems engineering lead for the Mars 2020 Perseverance mission. Her voice is well known as the commentator of Perseverance's landing on Mars in 2021. Previously, she also worked on the Cassini mission to Saturn. The Orbiting Carbon Observer Observator 2, and GRAIL, a pair of spacecraft flown in formation to, the, to map the gravitational field of the moon. As you can see, Dr. Mohan is a visionary leader of the aerospace sector, leading some of the most exciting missions to continue exploring space. So welcome, Dr. Mohan. Thank you so much for taking your time to inspire the next generation of aerospace leaders through this interview today. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be chosen to be part of your podcast. Thank you. Yeah, you know, just to kick off our conversation, I wanted to first start off by asking about your typical day at work. I know usually probably there is never a typical day, but how does your day generally get structured? So there's kind of two phases of my typical day. Uh, one is when you're in the early design phase of a mission. It's usually a lot of meetings, a lot of talking to people, brainstorming, uh, working out problems on the whiteboard or on the computer, and then iterating and going back and talking to people. As we get into the later stages of a mission, when we're actually building hardware or flying it, then it becomes a little different because you actually have to deal with the constraints of the hardware. So it becomes more shift work, kind of like what you do in a hospital where we're assigned time either on the flight spacecraft that's actually being built or in the, the test bed, the mock-up of the spacecraft where we can test out our procedures, or our software before it goes onto the flight vehicle. So there were assigned blocks and you might be in there for a single shift or a double shift, which means uh, anywhere between like 7 and 2 or 7 and 11 p.m. or 2 and 11 p.m. or uh, unfortunately, if you pull the night shift, you're on from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. all in uh, the favor of doing the testing and getting the spacecraft ready to launch. We only have certain resources, so we all have to trade in using those resources. So you get assigned blocks of time. And this kind of continues into operations. So after we launch, we're assigned blocks of time with the Deep Space Network to actually communicate with spacecraft that are going uh, out Earth orbit. So our shifts are based on when we can actually communicate with our spacecraft. So depending on when that time is, which depends on what station can actually see the spacecraft uh, in space. Uh, it'll drive the times here on Earth of when you have to report into mission control. Wow, yeah, I never, I, for some reason, I never realized how we'd have to work around the schedule of, of all of this <laughs> in your daily schedule. So I think that's, you know, keeps you exciting. Every day is probably definitely different when you're working on different missions, especially. So that's wonderful. And, you know, I have to ask, I mean, I'm sure this is a very difficult question for you because you've been a part of so many incredibly cool experiences at NASA. But if you had to pick one, what would be the most memorable experience for you so far at NASA? It would definitely have to be, I would, it's going to be a two part answer. Um, the Perseverance landing and everything that surrounded it is definitely the most memorable. And not just for the landing itself, but it was such a unique time in the world with the pandemic and we were still trying to figure out stuff and the, the energy around the landing, not just here, but around the world and um, all the media interviews I did and how much it was received after the landing day when we had the spectacular success was like very poignant and it was kind of topped off by uh, a few weeks later after landing um, uh, we at JPL got to have a live video call with President Biden uh, and I had the opportunity to speak to President Biden so that I think was a kind of out of this world experience that was definitely memorable. 
Yes, I, I remember that day. I, I, you know, that was actually the moment where I got to learn a little bit more about your work and just seeing the landing was so powerful. And during, as you're mentioning, it was during the time of the pandemic where things were very down. To, so to see that science and NASA was still doing so much to advance exploration, it was just kind of like a light in what we were going through at that moment. So yeah, I'm sure I'm sure nothing beats that, that incredible moment. This is something I still also really remember and treasure. And so what future missions are you excited for that you're currently working on maybe yourself or just NASA's doing um, in general, what future missions are you most excited for? Yeah, there are so many future missions that it's hard to pick one because there's also a lot like in various stages. The NASA does a lot of uh, conceptual uh, like brainstorming about future missions. So there's future missions that are currently being worked on that might launch in like 10 to 10 to 12 years that are in the phase where they're actually like being built or designing designing the mission itself. And then there are these early phase concepts, which are like these out of the box uh, ideas of what could be. And those are really exciting. So the the one that I'm working on right now, which is a future mission hoping to launch around the 2030s, uh, is called Mars Sample Return. Uh, Perseverance was actually the first leg of Mars Sample Return, where it went to Mars and it's collected these awesome samples that um, are selected based on their ability to preserve life on Mars. So if we ever wanted to discover whether there was life on another planet, these samples are kind of uh, the first try or the first attempt at being able to do that. So the Mars sample return campaign involves another lander to go that has a rocket on it, which is the Mars launch system that will actually take the samples, put them into a canister, and then launch them off the surface of Mars for another mission to come and like do a catcher's mitt and then turn around and come back to to Earth. So that whole campaign is really exciting because it it's so many of the most complex technical challenges for one mission stacked in the series that have to all happen sequentially in order to work. So it's not just a massive technological challenge, but it's also required uh, an unprecedented level of cooperation across the world with multiple space, space agencies to make that happen. So that sort of dynamic is something that uh, we haven't necessarily done on this scale before, which kind of makes it exciting because it feels like it's everyone in it to go to go get those samples. Um, in terms of like more out there type of missions, uh, there's a mission maybe in work that's like the next James WST uh, telescope, which is called the Habitable uh, Worlds Explorer. So uh, a next generation telescope that could actually um, find an image Earth-like uh, planets around wow. other stars, which is super exciting. Um, and then I think in the decadal study, uh, uh, Ocean Worlds is going to be a forefront of the next generation of exploring. Things like Enceladus or uh, Europa Lander, where we think that there actually might be liquid water underneath these these cold ocean worlds. And when there's water, there's a, a chance of finding life. So being able to explore those worlds, um, even maybe out to Uranus to do an orbiter, because we haven't really explored the, the Neptune-Uranus system. So this is kind of a, a taste of the exciting missions that are to come that are in various stages of being developed. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think it's just such a broad like variety of what we're trying to look for and what we're trying to explore in each of these missions. And as you were speaking, I couldn't like I was thinking about this. How does NASA choose like which missions to prioritize first or which ones to come first? And also which I'm sure when you guys are brainstorming, everyone has 10 different ideas and we could do this, we could do this. How do you narrow down from all of these hundreds of ideas into a few select ones that are the ones that NASA chooses to pursue? That's a really good question. NASA actually works hand in hand with the scientific community. So the scientific community uh, comes together in each of the different um, planetary, each of the different like scientific uh, fields, so to speak. So there's like an astrophysics field, there's a planetary exploration field, uh, there's an earth science exploration field. In each of these um, disciplines, they come together every 10 years and they put out what's called the decadal survey. And in that decadal survey, the, all the scientists or the preeminent scientists in that field will come together and say, for holistically looking at the science, what are the types of missions that are the most important to pursue? And they'll categorize it by what are, what's the top priority, what's the medium priority, uh, what's the priority to do in like the next five years, in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years. Um, and that basically provides NASA with a roadmap to say, uh, this is the science okay. that the community is looking for. So this is how we should 
uh, prioritize our funds. And NASA has different tiers of missions. So they have these like small explorer missions, which may only have like one instrument on it and can do a, a dedicated science. They have this mid range uh, type of mission where it maybe has like two or three, but it has uh, one focused uh, purpose. And then it has like the flagship level mission, which has 10, 12 different instruments. And it has like a super complicated um, mission profile where it may be doing like flybys of multiple moons or, or things like that. So using the decal survey of what the top priorities are and then using the um, these different tiers of missions, uh, NASA will usually like assign the flagship level missions depending on what the decadal says is the highest priority. And then the, the mid to small range, um, they put out proposals actually. So they compete those missions. They say, we wanna fund a mission in this uh, price range, in the middle price range, they'll give a cost cap and they'll put an open requisition out to different um, agencies. So places like the Jet Propulsion Laboratory or NASA Goddard or Houston um, or industry will actually come together and brainstorm ideas based on what the decadal survey says and say, oh, we think we can do a mission to Venus, it answers like these three questions in the decadal service and here's our con ops for the mission itself. And the NASA will uh, convene a board and they'll go through all of these proposals uh, and then they'll like rank them on like scientific merit, technical feasibility, uh, implementation wise and cost and schedule. Um, and then they'll, they'll basically select from there. So that's how the next set of missions get selected. So it's kind of two parts, either assigned or competed mission. Okay, wow, I had no idea about the decadal survey and how NASA does that. I mean, NASA is a government agency, so to know that there is so much thought process that goes behind picking these missions and also like designing and organizing them. I, I wow, okay, I had no idea. So that's really great to know. And as you were speaking, like I, you know, couldn't help but notice, I'm sure everyone else knows as well, you have such a great passion for space and space exploration. And I think it just excites you to talk about all the different things that we are doing and have done and will do in the future. And so I have to ask you, what was the aha moment that inspired you to pursue a career in the space industry? I'm sure there's always this one moment that just defines someone to be like this is what I want to do so I mean what was that moment what was that journey like for you yeah I think the the journey was slower before I got to the aha moment so uh I got interested in space as a young girl by watching Star Trek I remember the very first episode that I watched and just seeing people like traveling through space and exploring it uh, and that particular episode was all about like learning about a new region in space and how physics is different in that region, which was really cool to me that kind of exemplified the fact that we don't know everything that's going on in the universe. Uh, so that really stuck with me, but I didn't, I didn't consider it a profession, right? Like I didn't consider that it was something that you could actually do. Uh, it was just a hobby that I like to learn about and read more. Um, there was one point when I was in high school where I'd been trying to go down this like biology pediatrician route because that's what I'd said I'd wanted to do. Um, and I had like done research in, in a lab over the summer and I had written my science fair project. And I was really proud about it. And like, I didn't do well in the science fair project at all. Like I didn't even place and I was really upset. So I came the next year uh, and I was thinking about what I wanted to do uh, and I couldn't figure it out because I wanted it to be really good. And, and my mom at one point said, well, you like space so much. Why don't you do something on that? And I was like, hmm, that's interesting, but I don't have access to a telescope. Like I don't have access to like real data. Even if I had access to real data from a mission, I would have no idea what to do with it. Um, and I ended up like reading more about it. And I did a, a simple project um, about if we wanted to send humans to Mars, uh, how would they eat? And how would plants grow on Mars? And it was like, okay, well, Mars's soil is uh, heavily iron oxide. So could plants actually survive in that in that soil? Because obviously you wouldn't want to bring all the dirt from the earth all the way to Mars. So you'd have to use some of the stuff from there. So could you actually use the soil from Mars? So I just did a simple experiment uh, where I just varied levels of iron oxide in the soil, which iron oxide is really simple. You can just buy it at Home Depot here because it's used for a lot. Um, and I, I actually placed, like I placed in my high school, um, high school uh, science fair and I went to regionals and I got like an honorable mention at regionals and that kind of started the brain clicking of like 
wait, that may is there something here? Like, is I can I think about something else here that maybe I don't have to do biology? Um, the next year, I managed to convince my parents to send me to space camp, uh, which at first I just wanted to go to because it sounded super cool. Um, but going there, space camp is cool because it's not just like the fun part of space. They actually have lectures too. Um, and I was I was like almost too old to to go to the kids space camp. So I was in like the, <laughs> whatever the highest bracket is. So you actually get college credit. They have enough lectures oh. throughout the week that you got like one credit um, in college and just learning about it and like doing some of the stuff. That was the first time where I went into like a mock mission control and like put the headset on. And there was something about that moment. I was like, this feels, this feels right. Like I, this seems to be my space. Um, and that, that started the switch of like, okay, I don't want to, I don't want to do biology anymore. Let me see if there's a path here. Um, I had a really good physics teacher that made it super easy and understandable to me, like it came very naturally. So I started talking about physics um, and ended up wanting to go into engineering. Uh, so I combined the, the space and the engineering to follow that path. And to me, space meant NASA. So that's the direction that I went. Wow, I feel, I mean, first off, your mom knew best. She, she knew you were excited about space and encouraged yeah. you in the right direction, which is great. And, you know, I feel like, yeah. honestly, we were living almost parallel lives because in ninth grade, I also did a science fair project on which rocket would have the highest apogee and, you know, what components would we have to change in the rocket to yeah. get the highest flight. So, you know, I think it's crazy how there are certain moments in your education that really can give you that confidence that spirit to be like hey this is super cool like this is actually more than yeah. just like a side passion it can be something real yeah. and I think there are moments like that that just completely change and I can see that in your journey clearly the, that moment in high school the physics teacher just all of that came together for you which is just it's amazing to see now from space camp that you're actually in mission control I think it's a great yeah. moment and you know in this journey did you have any obstacles and if so how are you able to overcome them I think a lot of times we we see our role models we see people we we admire on LinkedIn or Wikipedia and we're like oh they had an easy life but I'm, I'm sure it was filled with a lot of like moments where it was you, know, you had to go back and try a different way so I'm curious in your journey did you have obstacles and if so how are you able to overcome them and yeah, there are always obstacles and I think the what defines your success is not the obstacle itself or how many obstacles you have, it's how you react to them. Um, there's a couple that uh, really hit the hardest for me. There was always small obstacles, like particular classes were hard or I didn't get into something that I wanted to and you move on to the next. But there was two big ones that I feel like defined how I reacted to an obstacle. Um, the first one was when I was in high school, uh, there's a science and technology high school in Fairfax County uh, that my sister had gone to, my older cousins had gone to, uh, and I fully expected to go to because I wanted to do STEM. And if you want to do STEM and you're smart, then you have to go to the math high school. I didn't get in. Um, I tried again the next year. I didn't get in the second year. And e those two uh, rejections at high school really took a toll on me because it was it was like this affirmation, like, you can't even get into a science high school. What makes you think you can pursue science as a career? What makes you think you can get into to college? Uh, it was even more telling that I am the only person in my family who's lived in that who hasn't gotten in, which I find very, very ironic. Um, and, and it was a huge blow like to see others around me, like most of my uh, core friends have gotten in uh, and separating from high school. Uh, and it became hard to find motivation. Um, but in the end, it, it became more of a proving the way I reacted to it was eventually after I got through the grief of not getting in, uh, I turned it into the, well, you know, no, I'm going to prove to you that I didn't need your school uh, and do everything on my own. So it sparked a lot of like, no, I'm going to find my own internships. I'm going to find my own volunteer opportunities. I'm going to join like every single club. Like I'm going to build my own resume uh, in spite of the opportunities that you may be handing on a platter at your school. I'm going to go do it myself. And I think that really tipped it because um, my school, it, it was good, but it didn't necessarily have a lot of resources. It just didn't have teachers that um, could provide the the outside of school support. Set. So forcing me to take the initiative of going and doing that, I think has served me well, even throughout graduate school and, and into to my career of having that mentality of like, no, I'm going to go find a way to do it 
myself has been really helpful. Um, when I got into grad school, uh, like halfway through my grad school, um, my lab went bankrupt and, and my advisor could no longer pay my stipend. Um, and I had a fellowship, but it wasn't enough to cover all of the tuition. So suddenly I was in, I was like a year and a half away from graduating with my PhD. And like, I didn't, I was like, I can't, I can't stop now. I'm like a year and a half away from graduating, but I have no money. And obviously I can't pay for it myself. Like the tuition plus all the room and board was way more than I could turn up in, uh, in the span of a few months. And by the time I found out about the lab being bankrupt for the next school year, like it was past all the applications that you could do for fellowships and stuff for the next school year. So there was, there was kind of no pre-planning that could have, uh, could have helped. And this find a way to do it yourself um, mentality came up where I, like I work for my advisor and I end up um, like finding a, getting a job at JPL to cost, offset some of the costs. And I went non-resident because my husband was living in Miami at the time. So I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be on campus and did this like weird shenanigans with like working here, but being a student there, but being a resident and like finding every loophole in the the educational system that like got us through this hump so that I can graduate. Um, but that moment of like, are you are you this close and you're gonna let this obstacle stop you from getting to the finish line? Um, cause you to rethink what you, what really means and how to to move these puzzle pieces around to actually uh, to get to get it done. Those were two very poignant memoirs because it was one where you're like so close to the finish line or you could see the path that you wanted to go on. There's suddenly this huge barricade gets put down that was not of your doing, like had no control over. Uh, and how do you get past that to actually continue? Wow. Yeah. Thank you for being so like open about that because I think a lot of times it's so easy when you get like an immediate like obstacle or barrier to be like, oh, I'm going to turn around and do something completely different or I'm going to stop yeah. here and maybe this is not for me and just give up on it. And I think yeah. the mindset you had of, oh, I'm never going to give up or I'm going to, I'm going to do something differently. I'm going to do it even better or I'm going to find a completely different path to do this. I think that is like such a strong mindset. And that's something that a lot of students should work towards getting I think it's a very difficult one to have but I think just trying to realize that there will be people things that happen in your life that you necessarily can't control all the time but how do I take yeah. that and how do I change it completely or how do I make a better situation out of it, or what can I learn from it to make me better so I think the fact that you took your obstacles as a way to learn and do something even cooler or even better I think is just it's a, so inspiring and I think so many students are even adults who are going through something in their life right now can really relate with and, you know, take inspiration from. And so thank you for sharing that about your journey. And so now deviating a little bit away, now that you're able to learn about your journey, think more about the future of space and to think about the future of space exploration. My question for you is what makes you excited and what makes you nervous about the future of space exploration? Well, what makes me excited is uh, just looking back on the last, you know, 50, 60 years of how technology has increased and our ways to leverage that in how we're able to build our spacecraft, the the intricacies of the computing that we can do on board and the levels of autonomy. It really allows us to speed up the questions that we can ask, the data that we can collect in situ that allows us this more rapid turnaround of learning and of exploration. Like, build a better spacecraft, it can send more data that we can more rapidly ask the next question is as you do this, you learn more and more and it kind of goes exponential. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that that exponential curve in technology that really catapults our understanding of where we are in the universe. I think the flip side of that is, uh, the benefit of that is that makes space available to, more intimately available to the broader public. The flip side of that is, uh, the commercialization of space. Um, I have to admit, part of what really drove me into space exploration in Star Trek was the uh, the purity of space exploration. <clears throat> and that the scientific endeavors are for everybody. It doesn't matter what race, religion, country boundaries, like it all benefits us all as humanity. Going to a commercialization aspect uh, suddenly makes you it brings concerns of how how to keep 
the ad quality that is there right now in space uh, as you bring more of that. It's kind of like, are we going to end up in a Star Trek universe or are we going to end up in an Expanse universe? And that's kind of the, the two extremes that I see um, that we have the option. You can either choose to hold hands and go into space or you can choose to to stake your to stake your flag and see where that takes you. And I really hope that we choose as a society to go, you know, the Star Trek crowd of spaces for everyone. Um, and we're going as members of the the human race, um, not to to colonize or to to reap the benefits for home world, but more for an altruistic purpose. Yeah, and, I, and that's why I always, whenever I do like these educational outreach programs, I'm always like, there could be, if there's always students who are interested in policy, and I'm like, you are the future space lawyers who will make sure that we figure out a way where every country can work yeah. together to advance space together. I mean, we need not just engineers, but we need all of these other skills, all these other people who are interested and talented in other aspects of, of the world. And, you know, whether it be journalism or communication or policy, these are all also important things of uh, roles people need to play so that we ensure yeah. a Star Trek reality, um, apart from the engineering yeah. advancements that we create. So yeah, that's incredible. And my last and final question for you, now that we were able to learn both about your journey, your work, as well as about the future of space, is what final piece of advice, you've given a lot of advice throughout the interview, but what final piece of advice do you have for young professionals um, about, you know, about, about pursuing a career in space or STEM or just going through life in general? Like if you could go back in time and give your younger self a piece of advice, what would that advice be? So the first, I have three pieces of this advice. Uh, the first one is to find your path. I get asked so many questions of like, how do I do what you do? Or like, how do I join the space field? And the, the first answer is you need to figure out what drives you. What is your passion? What is your strength and weaknesses? And then find a role that fits those two things. Because when you can pair those together, that's when you set yourself up for success the best. And in a particular field like space or medicine, there are so many different ways to contribute. There are so many different paths to getting there. I mean, I, I've met people at JPL who used to dance on Broadway or who used to be political oh, wow. organizers, who used to be like professional pianists, like who were English majors or history majors, right? And there's so many different ways to find your path that first and foremost, you have to decide like who you are, why you're interested in that, and what are the strengths and weaknesses that that you have so that when you pick a profession or a career, uh, you're setting yourself up for success and for enjoyment of that particular career. So that's kind of the first one. Uh, the second one is to, to create a good support system for yourself. Uh, some you're born with, like your parents. Uh, others you create for yourself, like your partner or your spouse. Uh, or your friends, these are the people who will encourage you. These are the people who will, when the the obstacles come, they're the ones who will help bolster your confidence or to, you know, my mom used to bring me the tea when I was upsetting late at night or my working with my husband to figure out how our shifts balance so we can handle the kids. Like you need that support system of people in your life who will work with you to help you achieve your dreams as opposed to, uh, you know, leaving you to fend for yourself or or actively um, detracting for your dreams. So that plays a huge part. And you have choice in that support system. Like if you, you want to keep your close circle, the ones who will build you up, not the ones who will um, make it harder for you to achieve your dreams. And then the third one is to actively do your best. And this kind of goes back to what I realized when I didn't get into the high school of you just because one door closes doesn't mean that's the only door to lead to your path. But sometimes the the best things come from initiative, right? From asking. Not not all doors are going to be clearly labeled with an application form and a, a schedule of events that, that you have to go. Sometimes just asking a question, like, oh, can I do this? Or do you mind if I volunteer for this? Can lead you down these different paths that you had never imagine that would be more up your alley because they came from something that you were interested in doing. And part of actively doing your best is to persevere, right? To keep trying to use every uh, experience, whether it be good or bad, as a learning experience and a building block to go to the to the next role. Because if you learn from it and you use it to 
pick your different career to pick, you know, which direction to go on or to try again, then at least you gained something from it, even if it wasn't what you wanted to in the, the first place. And part of that is being honest with yourself. I like what happened here? Why I didn't get it? What could I do better? And then using that for the, the next steps. Yeah. Wow. I mean, those are definitely pieces of advice that I surely will take to heart. I think, you know, firstly, just remembering, um, you know, spaces literally for everyone, there's so many interdisciplinary paths. Yeah. So finding that niche interest that excites you is so critical, but also making sure you have a supporter, a, you know, community of supporters, people you could fall back on, people who understand where you're coming from, who can continue to motivate you when things are low or a day is low. I think having that support system is so important, but also I especially loved your last piece of advice that like not every door or has like a label. I think that's so powerful. I've never, yeah. I've never heard of it, of that one before. I think just seeing how, you know, there's always like going to be applications you can apply for. There's things that are, you know, labeled yeah. opportunities, but you can create opportunities for yourself. I mean, I think just thinking of it like that is, you know, I mean, it's so, it sounds so simple, but I think people don't think of it. Like people that are not like, oh, let me just reach and, out to this person. Yeah. And it's not, it's not big things. It can be like small things. Like when uh, I had an internship at, at Goddard when I was in high school and we were, me and the other interns were like just walking around campus and we noticed a flyer for a model rocket concert, a model rocket like competition that Goddard was hosting. And we took it back to our, our advisor, like, can we, can we participate in this? And our intention wasn't that it, it was just like, you know, we're, we live in different areas. We just wanted like an hour or two to use the office like at the end of the day so that we could we could talk about it but he got so excited and so uh happy that we showed initiative that he helped us like he's the one who like drove us to the hobby shop the internship actually like ended up switching to be by like, building the model rocket like he drove us out to wow. actually like launch these rockets and it was such a great experience right to to put together the rocket and to have it come just from a question that we had asked was incredible and similarly like I had worked on a a project and I had seen a conference that was similar. So I asked the advisor, well, can I write a paper on this? And it had never occurred to him as a freshman or a sophomore, like that I should write a paper on this, but just, so he was like, oh, okay. Cause it thought it was mostly grad students, but I, I wrote the poster. Like I went to the conference and just being in the room, like you walk around these things and you learn and you absorb, um, it just takes you to the next step like oh okay and then when it mattered for like the real paper or conference that I wrote like I had already done once I'm like okay I've been there before like I know it and then you're kind of more poised to set up the next so it's it can be anywhere from like small things or like emailing grad school professors to get into a particular lab or for job applications like it it kind of varies and just showing the initiative no matter how small it is you'll be surprised at how it can snowball into to different things in your life. Yeah, I think that's so true. I mean, I when I first started this YouTube channel, I was so nervous to like reach out to anyone because I was like, yeah. oh, I'm just, you know, at that time I was in 11th grade. I was like, okay, I, I don't know anybody in this industry, like who's going to reach out to me. And then I just created a LinkedIn account and I was like, okay, let me just try reaching out to people. And I honestly, it took me a lot of courage just to send that first message. And you know, I think I found out through that process that people are willing to help. And all you have to do sometimes yes. is just ask, you know, asking can go such a long way. And, you know, there are going to be, be people who never respond to you. But I mean, there's a lot of people who are willing to help you out. And I think just taking that initiative, that first step to ask can make the difference of the world. That's a brilliant example. Just starting this this YouTube channel where you have a platform and you do the things you want to do. Now you can like meet so many different people, like go to so many different organizations and you get experience and then you can help others. And who knows like what that link, like they'll get inspired and then they'll go help something else. And it just leads to so much positivity in the world. It's just an incredible, incredible process. Just from that one little seed, I'm always am amazed at how much the butterfly effect can kind of create these huge uh, ripples through space. Exactly. That's exactly what I saw. And I think your advice is something that everyone, regardless of their age or where they're doing or what background or what career they're even interested in is such a critical one. It's such a critical piece of advice and something that I'm also like learning to get confidence in doing. I think asking is always difficult, but I think creating those opportunities yeah. for yourself and pushing yourself out of your comfort zone is, is so important. So really thank you so much, Dr. Mohan, for doing this interview. Oh. I honestly had a blast speaking with you. I felt like I could connect with you in so many parts of your life and your journey. And I'm so excited to see continuously like how these Mars missions will continue to evolve and to see your journey. And I you know, thank you so much <laughs> for taking your time to do this interview. I'm, I'm, it was just such an honor. 
This was super fun. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm really excited for the things that you're going to do with this podcast. I think it's a great platform for reaching out to everybody. So I hope you continue it. Thank you.